Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745. And before we get started, Drunken Barbarian in the live chat has brought up female soldiers in the Soviet Union and whatnot. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Okay, and female soldiers and partially dealing with Soviet Union. So if you don't, you want to just get to the gameplay, you don't want to hear my talk, you can jump to see when the map changes significantly. Okay. When you're talking about a nation, any nation, that is in a desperate situation, you're going to more likely see um, either official or unofficial um, females in war, uh, and in combat, I should say. Because we have lots, even in America, which isn't stressed, not like Britain, not like Germany, not like Soviet Union or Japan. America isn't stressed. Not that there isn't stress on America, but it isn't stress. They get at least tens, if not hundreds of thousands of women um, working in the armed forces, not just, um, you know, in factories and places like that. Now, in, say, the U.S. and the British cases, they're never put in combat roles. That doesn't mean they don't see combat. A lot of, there was a fair number, you know, in 30, 40, 50, 60, I don't know, um, female nurses in the Philippines as attached to our army. So they were um, military personnel of one status or another. Um, and they were in the, they were, you know, realizing when they were sent out there that the Philippines could become a combat zone, but they're not meant to be combat soldiers. So they're in the, they're in the field. Definitely so. And I know that there were women working for, whether it's for the RAF, for the Royal Navy or the Army um, in places like Malta. And that could have, my reason, because uh, obviously they were bombed in, in Malta and that the Germans and the Italians were planning on an invasion, never carried it out, obviously. But, you know, that very well could have been, and everyone realized it, that it could have either surrendered due to sort of starvation, being starved out, or been invaded. So they, they knew that they were in a combat zone. And both the um, British and the Americans used female pilots as um, aircraft ferrying pilots you know, around, well, Britain was a combat zone. You know, this was, including the days of the, um, you know, the Blitz and the, you know, the the Battle of Britain, not just later on. There were women pilots flying um, all kinds of aircraft, literally, but often um, fighter aircraft from, say, the factories to the squadrons up there. Few cases in which it didn't go so well uh, because they were, Entirely unarmed, um, you know, they had they had machine guns in them, but no bullets, and they sort of got swept up in combat as it happened. Though they, of course, tried to with radar and whatnot, they normally succeeded in you know keeping them out of the fighting zones. You know, current you know current active things. So obviously, there, there's a lot of women in the military, including in in Germany, uh, all the branches of service, Navy, Air Force, particularly. And in Germany, in combat in the Air Force, most assuredly, now these are um, uh, flak helfern, flak helpers in that case, in which they are, you know, whether they're the ones that are actually pointing the guns up into the sky and shooting at the, you know, American bombers or passing ammunition to the, to the guns, they were definitely, and that was a combat assignment. Uh, it wasn't just, oh, they have to be a combat zone. No, they were in a combat assignment um, helping with the flak guns. They're also using Hitler youth children to do that as well. And be very rest assured, the National Socialist regime very much cared about human life when it was the right type of human life. They were willing to spend the blood Oh, don't get me wrong. They were very willing to spend the blood, but they cared. They cared deeply uh, for the right type. The wrong type. Oh, hey, you know, the Holocaust. You know, I mean, we're, we're, I'm not saying that there's some sort of humanitarians or anything. It was for the right type of life they cared about. 
those drunken barbarians and Soviets didn't care about human life, and they didn't. You can look at their whole gulag system and everything else. They didn't care about human life. So, and they used combat troops. Now, I would not say the Soviets used combat troops or combat women, women troops, because they didn't care about human life. I am entirely looking at it as a desperation. Um, like, um, there were a few noted women snipers. There was, the, what is it, the night witches, pilots. Hey, IKB. Um, you know, the night fighter pilots, the women in outdated airplanes, but fighting at night. Um, and then you, there's like one case in which um, some woman's husband is killed, I think, driving a tank. And she raises enough money to pay for a tank, but sort of kind of on the agreement that she would get to um, go to war in the tank along with the rest of the crew. And she does. I think she survives the war. But in, in a combat um, unit fighting and driving a T-34 of one description or another. And so that's purely a, a voluntary situation. I think most of the women in the Soviet Union were sort of voluntary combat positions. So um, it's a bit different. Now, and I know some of you have had actual experience of it, being in the military and having women as part of your unit or whatever, and you can have your opinions. The real problem, the real problem with women in combat is not whether women can or can't do the job. Obviously, any person who understands science, now, uh, old, no, understands old school science, because modern science, you know, you, you, you talk to a modern person with a scientific de degree, he can't quite tell the difference between male and female. You know, I don't know how an anatomists have, have, you know, well, we're not sure if we're looking at a man or a woman, you know, and, you know I don't know. Um, but they can't quite. Um, maybe Marcel, but. Um, but the old school. Um, uh, science people realize that women on the average, because there is definitely women bodybuilders or power lifters that are a whole lot stronger than I am and probably stronger than I would be even if I did a lot of weightlifting and, and whatnot. That, but they are a such a small, small minority of, uh, fraction of, of the women out there that are that way. And so I am significantly stronger than the average woman. And so men on the average are stronger. But there are a bunch of women that can do the job. But it isn't about whether they can or can't do a particular job. The problem is primarily for the unit leader, but also the rest of the unit, because this has been shown particularly in Israel. I know some of the feedback when they used to. They no longer have women combat soldiers. Yeah, if you can choose, don't let them in your unit. You're right. Um, now, there's lots of women in the Israeli military. And actually, I think the primary tank school you know, that trains tankers in Israel, is made up entirely of women. And they know how to drive their Merkavas very well. But they're not a combat unit. They're a training unit. They train up other, and they do it well. They can have important positions. And I'm sure if Israel's ever stressed, they'll get in their Merkava tanks and defend Israel. That isn't a question in my mind. Um, it's, but they're not put up on... The line. Now, what is the real problem is, and I've talked to, trust me enough, veterans about this. Even again, I have not, full, I've never been in the military, been some ROTC training and whatnot, but I've never actually been in the military. But I've talked to enough veterans. But the real problem is, is the unit leaders, is the psychological effect on whether it's a lieutenant or a sergeant or whatnot. And when you pick that soldier, you know, you can look at the, the you know, that illustrates it, that um, 
I hope you've all seen, I know I, sometimes I get shocked at some of you guys that haven't seen some movie or other that, that, you know, I, I know they're maybe oldish now to you, but I used to watch, you know, black and white movies made, made during World War II when I was growing up in the 70s. So just because movies are old, in my opinion, is no excuse not to have seen them. But the big red one. Um, starring Mark Hamill and Lee Marvin about the 1st Infantry Division, or really more about a platoon in the 1st Infantry Division. But there's the one scene where they're they're storming the um, uh, Normandy beaches, and they're using the Bangalore, tor Bangalore torpedo tube, which is just, you know, every, you know, each soldier is carrying a section of it, and you sort of assemble it as you go, and basically, as you as you know, he, one guy puts two sections together, runs towards the barbed wire. He's going to get shot and probably killed. And then another guy is going to take his section and run up to and grab the other sections and try to put them together. And all of this while being machine gunned, you know. So you, you're picking soldiers basically to die. But if you just sit on that beach long enough, you're all going to die anyways. So you've got to fight your way off that beach. And it gets to the point that, you know, they, they almost got it there. And um, there's like a shot rings out or whatever nearby. Mark Hamill falls to the ground. And it's sort of like playing dead, maybe mostly initially for the Germans, you know, so they don't continue to shoot at him. He's not hit. And um, Lee Marvin is, and he's look, he eventually sort of looks back at, you know, at the platoon. Lee Marvin is pointing his M1 Garand at him basically going, if you don't get moving, I'm shooting you and then ordering the next person up to to move the the Bangalore torpedo tube to the barbed wire to blow their way off the beach. And so that's obviously, and it, I don't know if that, if any of that type of incident, you know, where there was actually, I don't know if there's, you know, been recorded or was needed, there was actually, you know, a platoon sergeant pointing his gun at, at a soldier saying, you're going to go or I'm going to shoot you. But that is a basic element within the military. You have to be willing to do that. And that's like the most direct way you're ordering basically someone to carry out a suit, not a suicide mission, but a suicidal mission, meaning it's likely to, you know, get you killed or kill them. Okay, that's sort of the extreme of it, definitely, and not the common experience of any of you soldiers out there, that that's a common experience. I'm not going to, because I just don't know well enough. Well, we did, there was something similar like that in my combat experience. Sure, okay, maybe, but it's not, it's not normal. That's an extreme case. But, you know, who's going to lead the patrol? Who's going to lead the platoon? Who's going to, you know, um, and moving around who's going to you know be first out in front to either get shot or step on a landmine and it's psychologically difficult for males to put females into that um stress and then once they die it puts extra stress on the leader of the unit and so again like i said i was in rotc gone through some of the training it's not equivalent to actually being in it i'm not trying to claim anything special here but enough that i was sitting there realizing that my job, if I, you know, were to go in, is basically to kill my own men. Not me shoot them. No, not at all. I mean, that was not even going anywhere. We are near that in any of the sort of training. Because they didn't even mention that. I mean, it wasn't even talked about. It wasn't even a, a possibility. But the idea of, okay, you know, Private Smith, you run over there and see if there's any enemy over there. And you know, half the way we're going to know is if Private Smith gets shot um, or somebody shoots at him or whatever. But you got to send somebody out first. You've just got to. So you point at some guy and you tell him to do something that's, that's dangerous. And if you do that enough, you know, enough different times through, through enough combat, you will have one of your people die. It's just, you know, enough you know, over time, you know, now if you're only in combat for five days and your whole Vietnam tour and you're, 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 because you're most, you know, in, in where you're actually, you know, bullets are flying because you're, I don't know, an artilleryman in a, in a fire base or something, well, you may get mortared or whatever. Um, but, you know, you're not actually leading a lot of soldiers, you know, into the firefight or commanding them to go in. Okay. You may not have, as a, as a small unit leader, you may not actually have that experience. But you do it long enough, 
you're going to have that experience where you're going to tell somebody to go out and do something and he's going to die. It's just going to happen. So you want to, you want to achieve your objectives with killing as few of your own people as possible. That's really how you have to starkly putting it, to achieve your objective with killing as few of your own people as possible. But you need to have in your mindset that your objectives, because of any hard objective out there, you're going to lose some of your people. It's just, it's just going to be that way. And yeah, I know there's you know, a lot of people that have been able to serve in Iraq or Afghanistan and get through a whole tour over there and nobody in their platoon is killed or seriously wounded. Yes, it can happen. But, you know, if it's enough in enough type of environment, especially of a, you know, and we were very much at the time looking at, um, you know, a, you know, look, it was one of my training officers very much had been serving as part of, you know, the American commitment in West Germany at the time and, um, you know, preparing to defend against the Soviet attack. So this was very much in the realms of not, oh, we're doing some counterinsurgency type operations in Iraq or Afghanistan where it's, yeah, you could step on an IED and get killed or lose your legs or whatever, or you can be mortared in your base or otherwise. And then once in a while, some soldiers get shot at. But, you know, and I'm definitely talking, there's, there's real casualty, real loss of life. I'm not trying to minimize any of that. And that is often very high stress on a daily basis. Okay. You know, and again, so, you know, PTSD is actually higher, in my opinion, in a, um, this again, in my opinion, in may not be true, in a counterinsurgency environment than it is in a conventional warfare environment, because you sort of kind of know when you're on and when you're off in a conventional war situation, where a counterinsurgency, your Bagram Air Base may be mortared at any moment. I remember hearing one guy talking about, um, it was his birthday. So for some reason, and I don't remember all the details, but he was going to go to the showers, but because it was his birthday, he went, was going to like stop by some, get something at one of the, you know, convenience store things or something like that. And had he taken his normal path from his barracks to the showers or whatever it was, he would have died because a mortar or a rocket fell approximately where he thinks he would have been. At least this is what it is in his mind. But there was definitely an, uh, you know, a rocketing that would have fallen on him and killed him. So he got lucky. So he had, you know, got up at this PTSD of just not even wanting to, you know, move around the base because he could die at any moment. And so I'm not trying to minimize the, the combat situation there at all. But it's just different than, say, what was expected a, you know, NATO versus Warsaw Pact kind of action that was expected to happen. And so, yeah, in that type of condition, you're going to lose people because the Soviets and the East Germans, they were considered good enough that they were going to hurt the U.S. and maybe overrun and drive to Paris. It was no like, oh, well, we're sure we're going to win. No, it was like this was, you know, the M1 Abrams had come out. But, um, you know, there's still lots of M60s being used, tanks. And yeah, it wasn't so clear cut of a thing. And so you don't want to put women into that environment to where you know you're going to lose people. And as a command person, you're going to put extra stress on it. And it just it's just not a good thing. And now I'll check what all these some of them are. I know our veterans here talking about. Probably telling me I'm full of bullshit, but I don't know. But including the Soviet regime, it's suggesting the woke. Okay, yeah. Um, there's a lot more points that they get. A very they get sick faster. Generally speaking, out there, they that is. I've heard that from multiple sources, Marcel. Yeah, that's that's what definitely, um, you know, um, women getting wounded and men trying to save her. Um, that was definitely Israel's experience with it. 
Um, yeah, I think there is a hard-coded genetic element to it, IKB chivalry, if you will. Um, oh dear, another lecture. High A's ads. So yeah, that's my lecture on it. I've given the topic multiple times, I know. If you've been around long enough, you've heard me talk on it before, and you'll hear me talk on it again. But yeah, that's that's why women should not be in combat roles. It is not based upon whether they can do the job. It's based on whether we're set up in such a way. And I don't really know because I don't think we really have enough experience whether female commanders, how they react. And I'm not talking what a colonel or a, even maybe down as, as a major is going to react so much of it because war becomes a lot more impersonalized the higher you go up. You know, the combat losses because you're not, you're, even though you may be on or near the front lines and seeing people die, but. For the most part, you don't know them like you would in your own platoon or whatever. You don't know the names, at least not beforehand. Well, thanks, Drunken Barbarian. And so that's just that's my understanding of the situation. See, look, look, look. Okay, I drew a nice defend this line. Why aren't there two divisions down here? This is just why I, I'm going to send them down here. They will do what I'm ordering them to do. But after that, I don't know if they'll just simply march back. And obviously we have enough divisions to fill the line. And it's just, you know, like, like I talked about, you know, the, the, the AI isn't smart enough to put mountain divisions in mountains. I mean, I sort of created a mountain division core here, if you will, and told it to defend the mountain division. Okay, so, well, maybe they'll stay down here. You know, so it's not even just do they make the best decisions. They're just, they don't even make halfway decent decisions. Okay, well, how bad are we still on artillery? Okay. Let's open up another production line of artillery. You know, new naval bomber types, but we're not yet making naval bombers. I'd like some. But I don't know if we will. In the spy game, well, currently we're setting up a network in Berlin. Is it ready yet? Okay, it looks like it's building a network. Um, it's 77% um, done. Maybe we can start doing some operations. Um, hmm. Okay, well, we guess like we could. Okay. Let's see if we can capture Cypher. We're going to bring in the other two agents. So the other guy's still running or setting up the network. Let's see if we can get the German Cypher, see how that helps us. So they had a choice. Canada did definitely have a choice. Um, especially after World War One and what sort of happened, particularly with Australians in World War One, they had a choice to do so. 
Canada, um, basically, um, did not draft people to go overseas to fight in the war. Um, there is something like a zombie army decision for Canada because they did eventually, I think, draft people to um, fill units that were garrisoning, you know, doing military duties within Canada. Well, somehow the United States took over this. Yay, Newfoundland. They took over Newfoundland. Hello, 27 Tinas. So, yeah, Canada's war was a voluntary war for its soldiers. Non-aggression. Yes, we want a non-aggression pact with Japan. We don't want to have to worry about Japan attacking us. India might not have had a choice to join the war or not, but their army was an entirely a volunteer army. So all of those that were fighting were at least volunteers. Now, people might well say that a lot of people volunteered for the army because conditions were really bad at home and it was the best sort of job to get. You only have four divisions assigned to that line. You need to assign others. To this line, you're saying? Okay, well, maybe. Um, let's just... Actually, what we'll do is we'll delete all orders. Can we have them all selected? Okay, well, now let's see what they reshuffle to. <coughs> Very good. Okay. Oh, one of our agents was captured. While behind enemy lines, Vasily Chibe Chibizos was apprehended by German counterintelligence. Okay. Well, we must do a rescue operation. Can't we just forget about him and hope he dies? In Soviet captivity. Prepared. Okay, commence. Not look risky. Well, who cares? You're doing it for the good of the people. Maybe that that can almost be be reasonable. Destroyers for that. Yeah, maybe. Bermuda, Newfoundland. Yeah. So I don't know of any bases up there that the U.S. got. I mean, they might have, but I don't know of them. There's a big difference when I say I don't know of it. Mostly, it truly means I don't know of it, as opposed to I don't think it happened. Mm. Mm. Well, two more artillery factories. But it would make some sort of sense. And that's why I guess they're getting Jamaica and what well, Puerto Rico already was. Um, so. Yeah. Oh, would you let me come in? I know we have somebody in jail, but. Oh, pull it diversify. Okay, well. Oh, this is just really cumbersome. I hate when that happens. Because it's tight. I can't just, like, pick a new agent to come back in. Um, uh, I don't even, but you won't let me commence it. I don't even know how to cancel it. Is there a freaking way to cancel it? So I can't run a rescue operation while well. OK. 
Okay, well then they're back here in Germany. Do they have to set up a new network now? Okay. Okay, well. I guess he gets to go on that one. Prepare it. Yeah, I, I just some of the ways some of this works I don't always get. Okay, so they did drunken barbarian. Thank you. I did not know that they got any up in Newfoundland. I like the concepts behind a lot of the spying stuff. I just think it's, I don't know, too focused. Takes too long. We have too few spies. We're really, I think, the way these are running, especially with the length of time it's running. I'd want 20 or 30 spies. And I know it's a lot to sort of manage, but... It just either you get to you can ignore the spy game or play the spy game as part of the thing and have a lot of stuff going on. We only got to, to do one line out here. Then the war was over. Damn. Okay. What other than artillery? Okay. Well, we've got now some pause of bow. I want lots of extra artillery. Like we have lots of extra weapons for either spamming out more divisions or. Just simply making up losses. I think more planes. Um, maybe more fighters. Okay, well, I think we need to start seeing about our military general staff here. Expert defense army. Oh, he's been purged by Stalin, purged by Stalin. Okay, so training time. Okay, training time lasts. That will be good even once the war really gets going. Just get the divisions out there faster. Okay, this isn't terrible. We've got two divisions sitting here where there's no river defenses. One division along most of it, and obviously I could assign more. And then here where you can be attacked from multiple directions, you've got, because I think this province can attack that one as well as here, and here you've got two. That's not the worst thing. Oh, they've canceled their non-aggression pack. Oh, 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 oh. Um, justifying against us. Hello, Cal Klaus. Yep. Things are looking problematical, as they might say. Okay. Well, I'm a little more worried about here now okay we've got 27 more divisions and three more armor divisions seven okay let's send one up here and no i do not feel prepared to deal with germany that doesn't mean i am or i'm not i just don't feel it Okay, um, 
Our defensive line. Okay, I guess our central defensive line. We'll send these guys out here. Sure, drunken barbarian. Be safe out there. Okay, yes, I take a look and see how Japan is doing beating up. Okay, they've taken French and though China is part of what? I guess that's just that's the Vichy thing. Yeah. Um, so they're pushing there. Okay, well, Japan's doing reasonably well. Well... Until I can do a higher level, I think we'll stop with that. Yeah, that's another, um, that's a, Japan declared war on the Philippines. That's another whole can of worms, which, mm. shall we say, very honest reports from, including in the Marine Corps, um, that a lot of that's going on, um, out in the, in just in the training field, shall we say, uh, with often both people married to other people that aren't supposedly, you know, separated or ending their relationships. And it causes caustic feelings amongst the platoon, meaning some some guys are out there getting sex in the, you know, on the training field mission or something, and the other guys aren't getting it. So there's that resentment going on. There's, uh, you know, other you know, it's not just jealousies uh, either of a particular man or woman, but just general. And then you have all kinds of other emotional things. I am for segregated units. Now, I remember, since we're still sort of talking about this, one sort of documentary thing and it, about Afghanistan and there had there was a female who was carrying a rifle attached to a platoon now she wasn't a member of the platoon but she was attached to the platoon and she was part of you know an outreach operation towards Afghan villagers and although the Afghanis wouldn't at first recognize her that she's a woman because she's wearing a helmet and you know glasses and whatnot, um, you know, protective glasses kind of thing. But as soon as she started to speak, and she spoke very little Afghani, but a little bit, especially the women would pick up on the tone of her voice. And then so she could go in and talk to the local women and whatever. Else. Okay, so so basically, it almost comes down to is the platoon is escorting her around. Now she was presumably, you know, I didn't check her out or anything, but presumably a competent gun handler and a competent person to know what to sort of do in the middle of a firefight. And so, yeah, I know he's got me back on the thing. Um, but so, yeah, there are roles that are in a combat zone and temporarily attached to. Yeah, OK, but not to have them integrated into the unit that have have segregated units, men and women segregated units is is the way to go and it's like when i was talking about the israeli tank school my understanding is all of the instructors are women in that particular school or, or whatever it's not some some yes some no so um you so it's you know for whatever good or bad it does however well 
the um, the students take to being, and these are generally, uh, my understanding is sort of you know basic tank driving and tank operations. Um, so you're not like getting quote unquote experienced men being taught told what to do by an inexperienced woman or something. No, these are the good trainers that know how to do it, talking to recruits into the. You know, okay, well, we need more tungsten. More rubber, where we're going to get the rubber from. We get it from the United Kingdom. More aluminum, where are we going to get the aluminum from? Not Vichy, France, we need to try for the US. Okay. And assembly lines. Okay. We're mostly just ignoring naval. Let's do anti tank guns. Improvement. Yeah. Um that's an issue, but what really comes down to the more issue, quite honestly, and Marcel could speak to this a little better than I can, is a lot of tank maintenance is a um, heavy lift operation. And so in driving the tank around, the women will be doing pretty good, but an actual maintenance of it, it's a bit more difficult. Now, with Israel, and not that women can't do it, it's just... Um, you need a lot more uh, cooperative operations. But if you look at the size of Israel, it's fairly small compared to, oh, I don't know, the size of Russia. So the amount, the distance a tank has to drive around, or even compared to like um, Iraq, the distance a tank has to drive around here is a lot smaller. So you don't, you know, you don't have as much maintenance on it because it's, it's, the, it's not, you know, not, it's... You know, yeah, you can drive it around a small track a lot of for sure, but it may not be such a such an issue there. But so I would say on the whole, um, men still have the advantage as tankers. Now, if you're talking pilots, you know, that's a different thing entirely. And I don't know how women deal with high G versus men deal with high G and whether it's better or worse. But that is where it really comes down to, okay, we need even more artillery because we must have had a bunch come. No, okay, well, more artillery it is then. Okay, I want to thank you all for watching. and Thanks for liking the videos. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel for more talk on... Um, on why women shouldn't come into combat. I don't know. Um, I'm not putting them down at all. I'm talking more about men's reactions to them than themselves. But love to hear your comments. See you next time for more Hearts of Iron.